Well, another month has passed by, so it's time for a portfolio update. I do a new one of these every single month on the 15th, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of those. But, well, this was not a very good month. As you can see, my portfolio is down quite a bit. I have actually added a lot of new money, which I'll get to shortly, uh, but the weight, money weighted return on this is very low. It's actually lower than what it my actual return is, or I should say lack thereof, um, but overall the markets have been doing very poorly. Everyone knows that. It's affecting everyone. It's no good, but it's not going to stop me from trying to invest more money and reaching $100,000 or, or selling off a ton of these stocks. It's not what I'm going to be doing. It can be very easy to narrow your focus on this short-term drop that we've seen. And I actually think it's important to take a look at how the markets have performed over the long run to see how this short-term dip compares to that. Now, if you go and look at SPY, uh, which is an index tracking ETF of the S&P 500, so this ETF tends to mimic the total return of the S&P 500, uh, if you just look at the last month, it looks very bad. Because it is. The market has dropped 20% in the last month. That's a lot of money to lose very quickly for a lot of people, especially those who might be nearing retirement or those who are overexposed in certain equities. This is a pretty brutal drop, no matter which way you put it. However, if we go ahead and zoom out a little bit to six months, still pretty bad. We're down 10%, and that's no good either, but certainly not as bad as 20. If we go back a full year, and it doesn't look as bad even so, it's only 4.61% down. That's over the last year, so we're still at 2019 levels almost. Go back five years, and we're still actually up by quite a bit. We are up 28% over the last five years. And really, we have only just reached about late 2017 levels, or just a little bit above that. Yeah, late 2017 levels or so, beginning of 2018. That's kind of the price level we're at. So we've erased a couple years of progress. That's no good. No one likes that. But if you zoom out, it really doesn't look as bad. If you go all the way back to 93, you can see that we're still near the top of this large bull run we had following this financial crisis. These 10 years, this is a big old rise right here. And we're still kind of near the top of it. We certainly haven't come halfway down. Hopefully we don't. It's hard, to t it's hard to tell with these sorts of things. But it's just important to put this in perspective that this dip may not be as traumatic as people are making it out to be. Of course, it is ruining some people's lives. Those who overexpose themselves or were relying on certain cash from trading in equities or maybe bought a bunch of uh, call options and watched the market vaporize them, that's no good. But if we just look at this over the long haul, long-term investors should not, not be too phased by this sort of drop. Not to say that they shouldn't be concerned at all, since there are a lot of overarching concerns that are relating to this financial dip. But if we just pay attention to the long term, which is what most of most people should be investing for anyways, is for the long term. Short term, you're going to have a lot of volatility and a lot of problems with things like stocks, and you have to be very careful when you're dealing with that. But over the long run, you can see that we still have this general positive trend. We have some sharp dips every few years. And we saw we saw the last one in 2008 with the uh, financial crisis, and now we're seeing it now with the the virus and other problems like that. Um, but otherwise. The trend is still upwards over the long haul. The trend only looks very sharp down when you zoom in and get tunnel visioned on this past month. And you see the 20% drop that's so terrible for so many portfolios. But then you zoom out five years and we're still up. So it just really depends on your perspective when you're looking at these sorts of short-term drops. Is this a sign that we are going to drop all the way back to 2008 levels and below? I mean, probably not. Is is every single company in the S&P 500 as an index really that much worthless than it was just a month ago? Probably not. Maybe they were overvalued before. Maybe this last year was complete overvaluation, but that still puts us well well above where we were many years ago. And that's really the whole point of investing. You just want to watch your money grow over the long term so that when you get to that long term, you can pull that money out and you'll have a lot of gains to where you can live a life that you want to live even in retirement or maybe you want to supplement your income if you're still working. That's what investing does. It, it gives you flexibility over the long run. 
If you're just relying on it in the short run, it can lead to a lot of problems just like this. If you were just focusing on this last month and are trying to make income off market swings that can go in any which way, as you saw, we had that 10% rally in the last 10 minutes of the Friday trading session on March 13th. Stuff like that happens a lot. Where we'll have large swings in just a day, up and down. You have to be very careful when you're dealing with short-term market fluctuations. But over the long run, we would expect it to continue on the path that the stock market has always been on. Obviously, there's no guarantee, but it's about as close as you can get to a guarantee in the investing world. But back to my portfolio, as you can see, I've actually reallocated some things. I've added a couple new slices to the pie, so let's take a look at those. This first little one is actually something I call the COVID-19 Opportunity Fund. A lot of these are actually companies working on a coronavirus vaccine, so obviously a lot of opportunity there for them. Uh, I guess Anovio is one of the current leaders, and their stock has swung up and down pretty violently over the last month. But that's not exactly that unique in this current market, as a lot of stocks have done that. I've also bought a lot of Carnival Cruise because I think they've dipped a little bit too hard. Granted, they aren't going to be having cruises for the foreseeable future, but I would imagine the company would still be hanging around by the time this crisis is over. Of course, time will tell. But this is a more opportunistic fund that has bought some that have dipped, I think, a little too hard based on what they are actually worth. And also takes in all of these companies that are working on vaccines and obviously there's tremendous opportunity there hopefully all of these companies will develop viable vaccines and they'll all do great and then the market will correct itself back up but obviously we can't exactly rely totally on that hopefully that happens i can a man can dream right but that's what this fund's focused on it's only one percent of my portfolio i have less than 100 bucks in it i just thought it'd be something hopefully lucrative to do if not it's higher risk, higher reward. If it doesn't pan out, oh well, it's a small portion of my fund. I've also reallocated these uh, funds, the Berkshire Hathaway Lookalike Fund, which I'll actually be talking about in further detail shortly, um, but I've lowered the allocation there and I've lowered the allocation on the BWC index, with which tracks a lot of larger corporations that have done otherwise very well over the last decade. Um, but I have lowered those allocations to make room for this income ETF slice. These are three large ETFs that focus on three very different things. This first one, VNQI, is a Vanguard ETF that focuses on international real estate. Here's actually the prospectus page on Vanguard's site. So it's mostly international REITs. And the reason I wanted to do this is because you might ask, why not do a domestic REIT or a mix? I'm already invested in some domestic REITs already, uh, partly from the Joseph Carlson slice that I have over here. Um, in this one, there's already a lot of domestic real estate here. But also, I'm going to be investing heavily in real estate myself anyways um, with my own portfolio. So I'm already going to be very exposed to the U.S. real estate market as it is. thought it would be a good idea to get some income-producing international real estate even if it may perform worse or perhaps better over time, I think it's good to have some diversity, not only in the types of assets you have, but also in the location of those assets and not just being totally tied to U.S. markets. Obviously, I'm heavily weighted in the U.S. market, as a lot of investors are, but I think it's good to have some diversity geographically in addition to the asset class. But in general, this fund tracks all, not all, but larger non-U.S. REITs in, it says, more than 30 countries. So just adding some more diversity to the portfolio, to the income per portion of the portfolio, that is. Now, another one I have here is this uh, K KBWD, which is a high dividend fund that, um, it's actually this one, that focuses on the financial markets. Now, financial markets not might not be doing too well in the sh near to short term future, um, but I think over the long run it should do well. It's basically financial sectors with um, high yield dividends. It follows this Nasdaq index, and it tries to focus on those financial companies with large dividend yields. Just more diversity in the types of assets we have. I obviously have financial assets already, or financial market assets already, so I would hope that this could add some more diversity there. And I'm not trying to wait too heavily on those, but it should be able to provide some higher income as well in the meantime. And the last 
slice of this income ETF pie is PSK, which is a preferred stock index. And here is the prospectus over here. It has an expense ratio of 4.5%. I'll actually go over the expense ratio of the other two if you didn't catch it. Um, but a preferred stock is a little different than a common stock in that the dividends are actually paid out first here to these stocks. They have some other drawbacks, which I won't go to in great detail here. But generally, it's a safer dividend, at least in the medium to long run. One would hope as long as the companies under this uh, index do well, but that goes for any stock, really. Um, it has a 5.5% dividend yield, or at least it did, and it's up to 5.91%. Now, uh, you'll actually see that in down markets because dividend yield is the dividend divided by the share price. So naturally, when the share price decreases, but the dividend stays the same, you'll see a spike in the dividend yield. That typically is only a short-term occurrence because either the dividend will come down or the share price may rally. In a market dip, we really wouldn't expect dividend yields to stay super high, artificially high for very long because if the price decreases, companies may be running out of cash and they're not going to issue as high of dividends in an effort to save cash. So typically what you'd see in a, in a true bear market is you'd see dividend yields spike and then they would quickly come down as companies readjust, at least those companies that don't have a lot of cash on hand, which will probably be many of them soon. Now, these aren't the only ETFs I want to add to this fund, but in general, it has an expense ratio. And let me go take a look over here. It has an expense ratio of 0.3, so higher than most ETFs, but the dividend yields almost 10%. That was about 7% about a week ago, but as you can see, it's dropped down very quickly as with the rest of the market. So the dividend yield has artificially spiked as well. We'll see how long those dividends stay the same, but as you can see just in the last quarter, it's done poorly, but it's been otherwise quite stable since a lot of the returns aren't really made on the equity side, but instead are paid out via dividends. And that's really the whole point of a lot of dividend investing is rather than take the money via equity, you're taking it more consistently as income. Uh, both have their advantages and disadvantages, and I just want to have some more income in this portfolio since I do intend to eventually take out some debt with M1 Finance, probably to use on other things, but if it makes sense to take cheap debt and throw it into this income pie, then that would be great since then the portfolio would just pay, pay off the debt itself. And that would be awesome, but just trying to set myself up for that over the longer term. But otherwise, what I actually want to do is sell off this Berkshire Hathaway piece of the pie. It's, it hasn't done well, but nothing's done well. And the, I'm not selling it because it hasn't done well. I'm selling it because M1 Finance actually has this a little annoying thing where you can only have 100 holdings in any one portfolio. And I have 100 holdings now since I've added those ETFs and these COVID small little shares I have. I don't want to get rid of these since these are more opportunistic anyways. But instead, what I want to do is sell this look-alike pie of Berkshire Hathaway stock, since it's not actually Berkshire Hathaway, it's trying to mimic what Berkshire invests in, but it, M1 Finance can't do that because it doesn't have all the private holdings that Berkshire has. It can't get access to those naturally because they're private holdings unless they somehow get in on the inside basically and try to get a hold of these private companies. So it's basically just trying its best to mimic, but it's not doing that great because it doesn't have those private holdings. And it's actually doing worse than Berkshire B stock right now. So what I'm gonna do in order to free up a lot of these holdings, since these, these are a lot of tiny little holdings that I don't really need, I'm going to, and just to show you how that's so, a lot of these tiny ones where I have a buck 50 or so in each of them are part of that Berkshire pie, which isn't performing well anyways, so I'm deciding I'm just gonna sell that off, replace it with a true Berkshire B stock, same allocation, and then I'm gonna actually add more income ETFs into this thing to actually diversify it a little bit more. And I'm gonna try to make that income ETF pie look more like this. It's gonna have those same three in there with, it's gonna have those same three funds in there, the global X US real estate one, the high dividend financial one and then the preferred stock one that I already have. It's going to have those in there, but I'm also going to add a lot of these high yield bond funds, some government bond funds, a couple broader market dividend funds, but all funds to give me a lot of diversity in my income streams coming in from this portfolio. In addition to things like the Joseph Carlson dividend fund that focus more on dividend growth, these will be focusing more on immediate income to help not only rebalance the portfolio, but as you have more income in this portfolio, because of the way M1 Finance works, 
the more cash that comes into this portfolio up here, it will auto invest it into other things. So it would be, almost work as a sort, sort of self-balancing tool. If you have a portion of your pie that's bringing in a lot of dividend income, it'll automatically get funneled into anything that's underweight and it will reallocate it as you designate in M1 Finance. That's probably the automatically will reallocate your cash towards the things that are underweight in your portfolio automatically. You don't have to do it manually, which would take a long time. And it can do that because it invests in fractional shares. That's how I have you know those little tiny shares of the Berkshire lookalike fund. And that if I otherwise needed to buy a full share price, it would be all out of whack. It wouldn't be balanced as I'd want it to. You can't get it that fine-tuned unless I have a ton of money in there, which obviously I don't. I only have seven grand in here. But that's going to be going up through time. That's another thing I wanted to mention. I've actually put in quite a bit of money over the past couple weeks. I had about two grand last month in this portfolio. The market's obviously gone down, so I've added quite a bit of money in the meantime. You can see from my funding history, I have added eight grand or so in total. And that's more than the two grand or so I had about a month ago. So we've added close to five grand just in the last month in an effort to buy the dip in a sense. Um, and I also want to get this thing up to 10 grand as quickly as possible because that opens up M1 borrow. But also I do want to take advantage of some of these cheaper prices. Even if the market still goes down more, I know I've at least gotten a better deal than the last week since I think a lot of these companies in these pies are probably going to be fine in the long run. Some of them obviously will fail since that happens to all companies over the long haul. But I would hope that a lot of these will do well in the long haul and we'll get through the short term volatility that we're seeing right now. So in short, I'm going to be selling off this Berkshire stock, replacing it with true Berkshire stock and not this lookalike fund, adding new ETFs to this additional income ETF slice here to add some more diversity. And then hopefully my dividend yield will be pretty high and I should be set up in the long run to have a good sort of half income portfolio and then a half equity portfolio with, with this Ben Felix lookalike fund, which is mostly broader index funds, value and small cap are probably going to do very poorly in the next couple months because of the current market conditions, but they're very broadly diversified in all sorts of stocks all over the world, especially this total stock market, which is all stocks uh, that are publicly traded that would give you the broadest diversity of any ETF out there. But if you guys want to copy this portfolio, I have a link in the description. It's not doing really any better or worse than any other portfolio, so if you just want a place to start, you can use it. I am not a financial advisor, and this video isn't financial advice, but if you still think this is a cool fund and you want to use it, I mean, go ahead. The link's in the description. It's free to use, and One Finance is a very nice platform. Now, full disclosure, I do get an affiliate commission if you guys do use my link, um, but that's of no cost to you, and I would still recommend giving it a look since M1 Finance is a very nice looking platform. It has some nice features with the auto reinvest and fractional shares. And it's something that every investor should at least consider, especially if you're considering jumping into the market or you want to diversify brokerages a little bit, uh, looking at you, Robinhood. But that's just an option for investors to have. And I want to show you how this platform works. It's part of the reason for this series, but also to track as I try to build this portfolio and getting to learn how to invest through a bad market, which over the long run, it really isn't that much more complicated. You're just adding money and hoping that it keeps going up. Obviously, investing in safer assets, well-diversified assets as you're doing that. Well, that's all I got today. If you like this video, be sure to give it a like as it helps the channel out a lot. If you want to see more content on stock investing or have a specific strategy that you like to use, be sure to let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss any updates. I post a portfolio update every single month on the 15th so you can see how I'm doing as I try to reach a $100,000 portfolio. My channel is on personal finance, investing, and real estate, among other topics, so be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss out. Until next time, take care.